didn't begin this project expecting to find the correct body. We didn't even know whether we would be able to tell if we did find it. We had to find essentially the right two square metres of the site, and the chances of us doing that were very, very slim. So when we started to find indications that we might be digging in the right place and that we were finding somebody with all of the characteristics that we could hope to look for, it was very, very exciting. And the team, I think, were overwhelmed, incredibly surprised and really quite shocked. Once Joe and I got the remains back to the lab, the work actually divides into two different routes. So Joe needs to go off and have a look at the bones. And what I needed to do was to take samples to be able to extract ancient DNA from. The skeletal remains were actually in extremely good condition. Now, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you'll be able to get ancient DNA out of them because it completely depends on the soil conditions. So what we did was we brought the remains back to the archaeology department and then what I did was I was very carefully extracting teeth from the mandible from which I would try and get DNA. Because DNA is essentially protected within the interior of the tooth. It's got a hard outer coating and it's not in direct contact with the outside world. So that means that it's a very good site for us to target. I also wanted to get another sample from a different part of the body. And if you're going to be able to get DNA, the femur is probably the next best bit to go for. Okay, so that's the back left M3. When we come across a skeleton that we want to establish an identity for, what we have to start off by doing is building up a biological profile of that individual. So we need to know what sex they were, we need to know their age at death, and we need to know about any other identifiable physical characteristics. Interestingly, the skeleton itself was very slender for a male. Generally speaking, male skeletons are more robust than female skeletons. This skeleton had bones that almost were more like the female range of variation than like the male. And this is interesting when we look at the historical sources about Richard III, because they do talk about him being unusually slender in his build. The position of the spine in the grave was interesting. There was a very noticeable curve in it, and that's not something that can occur just by accident. That's not something that can happen just by squashing the skeleton into the grave. We could tell from the position of the various bones that there had been no movement in those bones after death. So they were still in exactly the correct anatomical position, and that gave us a very good idea of the nature of the curve in the spine. Interestingly, we can also see evidence from the vertebrae themselves. The vertebrae in the area of the spine that was affected by the scoliosis are quite abnormal in appearance, and they have various different features that would all have combined to create the scoliosis as we saw it. So we have two scales of evidence, if you like. We have the evidence of the whole spine in the ground, which we can see the curve on, and we also have the evidence of the individual abnormal vertebrae, and those build up to give us a picture of what the scoliosis was like.